All right, a very good morning to everyone and good morning to those who are online, uh, tuning in on Facebook and Zoom. Um, this morning's topic is, uh, is from the book of Jude and it's, it's basically about contending for the faith and contending for the faith in the face of false teaching. Now, I'm aware that we've had false teaching come up once before and possibly twice before and this is the third time and I'm aware that whenever something happens three times in scripture, whenever it's mentioned three times in scripture, we are to take very good attention to it. So, I'll start by reading Jude 1 through 16. No chapters here, single single chapter letter here. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own positions of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality, and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people also rely on their dreams, defiling their flesh, rejecting authority, and blaspheming the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds, swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It is also about these that Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism for gain, favoritism to gain advantage. That's a big chunk of scripture, and I've probably just used up most of my time reading it. <laughs> but let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Jude. Thank you for the letter that the half-brother of Jesus wrote to urge us to contend for the faith and to encourage us 
Father, we just pray that as we look into this, this book and what it has to say, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would convict us where we need convicting and challenge us where we need challenging. Father, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jude is writing this letter at a similar time to the other two letters which we have looked at on false teaching. He writes this at a similar time to Peter's second letter and to Paul's second letter to Timothy. It's just a little over three decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A similar timing to address a similar issue. False teaching is starting to creep into the church. Jude introduces himself in verse 1. And note that he does not claim brotherhood with Jesus, but rather servanthood. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. He does, as we see there, claim brotherhood to James. James, who was a bit of a big gun in the Jerusalem church, was known as James the Elder. He too was a brother, a younger brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, a stepbrother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reminds the reader of this letter, and that's you and me, not just the people who received it back in the day, of whose they are and who it is that has loved them. To those who are called beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. It is important, considering what he is about to challenge them and us with, to remember that, whose we are. We are kept for Jesus Christ, and we are beloved of God the Father. And next week, as I unpack the tail end of Jude, we'll be looking into this a little bit more deeply. He then wraps up his introduction with the standard may, pay, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. In verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you of our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you to appeal and to contend, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude's plans have changed. Although he was going to write a letter celebrating the salvation which we all have, he's called to an urgent problem. The fundamental truths of the nature of the faith are under attack. Jude's urgent call to contend for the faith is an urgent call that we here today need to hear you. Because today we have false teaching coming into the churches. We have false teaching infecting the faith. False teaching such as the acceptance and in some cases even the affirmation of sin and the denial of Jesus Christ as Lord and God. But what is this faith? What is this faith that he is talking about? Well, it's simply put, the message of salvation and restoration, is it not? It is the message that we need to repent of our sin, for all have sinned. We need to repent and quite literally turn away. In 1 John 1, 8 to 10, we read that we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. The 
The word rem- repent means literally to turn away and to denounce, to renounce. It's not just to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I got caught out. I'm sorry that I hurt you. It's quite literally to denounce the actions that you have done, the thoughts that you've thought, the things you've seen. It's quite literally to turn away from them and walk in the complete other direction and to sin no more. Romans 6 verse 1. And the entire chapter of Romans deals with this, but we'll, we'll cut this down for the sake of time. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may increase? By no means is the exact words which he says next. We must proclaim that Jesus is Lord and is God not only with our mouths, but with our lives and with our actions. And we must believe that he has been risen from the dead, as it says in Romans 10, 9. Jesus is God and Lord's of our lives. This is not just a verbal thing to say. This is not just something which says that we say on a Sunday morning. This is not just something that we say when people ask us, what do we believe? This is something that we say by our very actions. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before the Father who is in heaven. But whomever denies me before men, I will deny it before my Father who is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, his death and resurrection are enough to save us. But his death and resurrection should make a change in our lives. He is the perfect sacrifice. In Hebrews 9, verse 12, he entered once for all, into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and of calves, but the means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. This is for all of us. If you know the Lord, if you do not know the Lord, this is for you, a free gift. Accept it and turn from your sin. Is Jesus the core of what you do? Do you love him with all your heart? In 1 Corinthians 10.31, and I apologise, I'm going hard and fast with these, but there's plenty to pack in here. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Do you eat to the glory of God? Do you drink to the glory of God? Do you drive your car to the glory of God? Is God at the core of all you do? Do you come to church to the glory of God? Do you study your Bible to the glory of God? Do you have friends for dinner to the glory of God? Do you watch the footy for the glory of God? Colossians three seventeen. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything. All order, but is what we're called to do. All the law is central to the fact that we must love God. And why wouldn't we love God? He gave His own Son for us, even when we were the ones who wronged Him. 
Matthew 22, 37 and 40, through to 40. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. Note, note that. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. A dear brother of mine once said that there are three ways that you can obey the law, that you can be a good person. One is exactly that, to follow the letter of the law. But to follow the letter of the law is cold and heartless and you're only doing it as long as the law is just and right. The second way to do this is to do the moral thing. What is right for the other person? What is good? What is just? What is good for me? What is good for society? Once again, that falls short. Once again. The third way is a much better way, as we read in Corinthians. To love. If you love the person you're about to act against, why would you want to harm them? If you love God, why would you want to rebel against him? If you love your neighbour, why would you have strife with him or her? Why is this faith important? Well, it's important because sin separates us from God. You have sin in your life. Have you ever noticed how silent God is? Hebrews 10, 26, 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be reserved for the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It comes back to, why would you, why would you sin? Why would you willingly sin if you love your Lord. Yes, we all fall in sin. Yes, we, we make mistakes. But that doesn't mean we go out and keep doing the mistakes deliberately. Sin separates us from God and there is no other name by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to God because he is God. He is the one who bridges the gap between man and God. He is the one who pays for our salvation. He is the one who represents us before the Father. He is the only way we can be saved. And if anyone tells you otherwise, they're telling you a lie. And finally, it is, it is important to strive for this faith because there is a reward waiting for you in heaven once you do. Given to you by the Lord Jesus himself. 
in Revelation 21.7, and all throughout Revelation, actually, if you read the seven letters in Revelation, you'll see that each of them have within them to him who conquers, to him who overcomes. And this one says, to the one who conquers, and this is at the very end of Revelation, to the one who conquers, uh, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son get adopted into God's family. Paul says that he uh, finishes the race and receives a crown. That too is in Revelation as well. These are the promises for striving for the faith in our own lives and in our church life. So, how can we tell there's a problem? How can we tell that there are false teachers in our midst or even false Christians in our midst? How can we test ourselves verse 4 says for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ well one of the first signs we see here in this verse is a perversion of grace missing the point of grace and we've touched on it earlier today. Why would we go on sinning? Shall we continue sinning so grace can abound? No, no. The point of grace is so that we can get our eyes off of our sin and focus on God. We are to be aware of it, but not focused on it, or even indulging it. We are to keep our eyes fixed on the Saviour, just as Peter was when he was walking on the water. By the way, one of my favourite stories in the Bible. Because the moment we take our eyes off, what happens? We sink. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The second thing we see here is they've perverted this grace into sensuality. Now it is all about what you feel. Faith is not feeling. Yes, you may feel the presence of God, definitely. But faith is knowing and trusting God. It is trusting God, knowing how great and gracious he is. In Hebrews 11 verse 1, we get the short verse which says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. the assurance and the conviction. These are sure things, not feelings. These are things which you can know. God is someone whom you can know. But how will you know him if you don't read the scripture? How will you know him if you're not in prayer? How will he give you this faith? Because God is the one who gives us faith. We can't do it ourselves. We can't believe God into existence. And God doesn't disappear when we stop believing in him. Third thing we see here is that they deny Jesus as Lord of their lives. They are disobedient. If you appreciated what your sin costs Jesus, why would you disobey him? Many false teachers, whenever they are given a curly question, and many Christians will say, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. But I heard one preacher say that this is tantamount to an abusive relationship. (laughs) Because they say that they do these things because they love the person they're abusing. But they're abusing the salvation, the free gift which has been given them. Another quote is, the single greatest cause of atheism is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. But I'd like to bring this a little bit closer to home, that this can cause atheism in your own life. 
God becomes a joke. Salvation becomes meaningless. Now, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit here because Jude has a case of the gallops, as we saw earlier. In fact, he puts Paul to shame because Paul, he tends to go on to a topic and then come back to the end. Jude just keeps going and going. So I'll be jumping around a little bit here and I'm going to jump to verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. Scripture is of utmost importance. It is good for teaching and reproving. Dreams, on the other hand, they're nice. Sometimes they can be better than reality. But do not base your faith off of a, off of a dream. Base it off of the word of God. Defiling the flesh. This can be through mutilation of the body or it can be through sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, lustful actions. And as we'll see in a little bit, God is dealing with these false, false teachers, these false Christians, that it, it crops up again. They reject authority of elders, of scripture, and of God. They blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, when I looked into what the glorious ones meant, there were two conflicting opinions. Well, maybe not conflicting. One opinion was blaspheming against God and his angels, not taking them seriously. The other one was being dismissive of the spiritual risk of their actions with regards to being opened up to demonic activity. Either way, these are dangerous, dangerous paths to tread. And verse 10, but these people blaspheme all they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand ex instinctively. They cannot understand the faith which is on offer to them because they're still thinking world worldly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22 to 25 For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's only by the illumination of the Spirit that we can approach Christ's cross, the work which is already done in your life. However, if you're fixated on worldly things, even if you've professed a faith, how are you going to understand it? How are you going to live it out in your life? 1st again, we see that they are resulting to feelings, to carnal base urges, and their wisdom. And this will all lead them to destruction. They're like unreasoning animals. They're doing what comes naturally. Proverbs 26, 11 and 12. I've got to admit, when my dad showed me this verse, I giggled a little. But now it has more of a serious connotation. Like a dog returns to his vomit, a f is a fool who repeats his folly. Do you see 
a man who is wise in his own eyes, there is more hope for a fool than for him. God has made foolish the things of this world. In verses 12 and 13, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild seas, wild waves on the seas rather, casting up foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. At your fellowship lunches, at your meals that you have put on to host for people to come around to have fellowship or even ones in the hall. They are like hidden reefs about to shipwreck people who are not firm in their faith. They have the mentality of she'll be right, mate. We'll be okay. God is good. He's gracious. It's only half of the nature of God. You must accept his grace. If you don't accept his grace, they're unafraid of what's coming. Whereas we, we must work out our faith with fear and trembling. They're aimless, dead inside, hungry, and they don't know why. Fruitless and utterly empty. Waterless clouds. Being in the middle of the drought and looking up and seeing the clouds hovering overhead, but they just refuse to give rain. I can, it's a frustrating thought, especially if, you, if you're a farmer or you know farmers. Imagine how God feels about these waterless clouds. Their destination is utter darkness. And we see in Revelation that many are cast out into that darkness. Verse 16, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. They're only in church for what they can get out of it. Instead of giving glory to God, they proclaim their own glory. And they're looking for political gain. They're looking to get power within the church. They're looking to move up the ranks. None of this is focused on God. These are all things contrary to the faith which we looked at earlier. God will deal with these. God will deal with these false teachers and these Christians. As we see scattered throughout Jude examples of where God has already dealt with them in the past and examples of what happens. We have the example of those who were saved out of Egypt, who were destroyed later for their disbelief. Now we can look at this and say, okay, that's Pharaoh and Israel and the Egyptian army. You know, Pharaoh and the Egyptian army were destroyed in the Red Sea. But if we look a little bit further, we have the story of the bronze serpent in Numbers 21, four to nine, where because of the disbelief of the people, God sent serpents in to bite them, but there was grace still. There was grace still, and grace is offered to us to the very last moment. And that grace was in the form of a serpent which was raised up, and we see it, see it mentioned in John 3, that beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. Verses 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We have an example here also of angels leaving their positions. Now, 
Just so you know, this is referring to an account which is outside of Scripture. This is from the book of Enoch. This is a recording which we have one mention of in the canon of Scripture. And that mention is from Genesis 6-4 with regards to the Nephilim. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward there were sons when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old and the men of renown. Angels left what God had done for them, like what God had for them to do. They left their rightful station because they lusted over mankind and more specifically over women. They wanted to have children with the women. They did. And God saw this as an abomination. And what he did for them was he trapped them in chains, awaiting judgment, fiery judgment. We do have a reference to angels falling in Revelation as well. However, because Revelation is written after Jude, I believe that both Jude and Revelation may be referring back to this fall event. Or perhaps they're referring to different events. We see the example of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, 30 through 38, where unnatural desire, sexual immorality, was amongst one of the many sins which was being portrayed by the people of Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah. Both fallen angels and Sodom and Gomorrah reap eternal fire from God. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil about disputing over the, the body of Moses, he didn't presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael, the chief of archangels, doesn't pronounce judgment over the father of sin, who is also an angel. We shouldn't take it upon ourselves to pronounce judgment on our fellow brothers and sisters, for that's God's, and he has said what he is going to do. In Matthew 7, 3 to 5, we see the example of removing a log from your brother's eye, well, a speck from your own eye, uh, for, I'll get this right, log from your own eye and a speck from your brother's eye. It's kind of hard to see something small and minute in your brother and sister's eye when your vision's impaired by a log. We are to worry about our own walks and to contend for the faith in our own life and rebut false teaching when it is offered to us. Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. See how he likes to string stuff together? Gain did, Cain didn't give a sin offering and was rejected for it. This was an instruction that God had given and in Genesis 4, Genesis 4, 3 to 16, we see the result of that. He gets angry. And he kills what he perceives to be the problem, which is not the problem. The problem was with him. But he killed his brother. And God cursed him. Balaam sold out his faith in God for political and financial gain. Numbers 22 23 and 24. He tried time and time again to curse the people of Israel. And then he fully went over to the opposition and accepted bribes to bring down the power of God. God doesn't work like that. Korah attempted to usurp God's power and was swallowed up in number 16 was literally swallowed up by the earth because they thought they were better than who God had chosen. They thought to usurp 
that God had put in place. All of these were dealt by God, not by men. It's also about these that Enoch, the seventh of Adam, prophesied. Book of Enoch comes up again. Once again, we can see that vengeance is the Lord's. And in Romans 12, 19, we said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. In closing, I'd like to leave you with these four points. What is the point of your faith if you're not contending for it? You do not fight the good fight and work out your faith. To be more like your saviour and to love and know him better. What is, what is the point? We must be wary of the behaviours of false teachers who have crept into our lives and make sure that these behaviours don't creep into our own lives. You can be a false teacher with your mouth and with your actions. Often one will lead to the other. And it is for God to deal with those who are false teachers. We should revolt, rebut falsity, but we should keep in check, we should keep in check our own walks and remember that vengeance is the Lord's. commit our time to the Lord. Father God, as we look upon this scripture, I can honestly say that you have convicted me of a few things in my life. And Father, I just pray for us all here that we may be obedient to you in our day-to-day -day walks, not just on Sunday, in how we treat you and how we love you, Lord. Father, rekindle a love for you in our hearts, Lord. Father, I just pray that you continue to bless us as we walk with you. I pray all these things to your Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.